What's happening, people? And welcome to this week's episode of It's All Black Academic. Um, before we get into our show this week, we're going to pick up a couple of the man there who have been on previous shows, both Nels Abbey and Derek Owusu. You can see a couple of their books on display here. So if you've not copped their books yet, please go and do so. So speaking of books, we're going to talk about uh, one of the most classic, classic doesn't make sense, one of the most well-known, respected uh, books out there by the author, Marilyn Blackman here. We're going to talk about Noughts and Crosses. It's adaptation to BBC and, and the TV screens that we've seen as of this last couple of weeks. And also many of the themes that have come from the book regarding black race and also being in Britain in 2020. And to do so, I want to introduce, I've got a fantastic panel here. I would say arguably my best panel so far. Yes. <laughs> cool. You're a guest man. That's in the thing. I've got Simeon Brown here, journalist and broadcaster. How are you doing, sir? I'm all right, man. I'm well? good. I'm all right. Good. Cheers, cheers for coming on again. Um, we've got making her debut on, on, our, on our show here, um, one half of the Black Girls Book Club, mm -hmm. Natalie Carter. How are you? I'm good. You well? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. And you, you're like a regular, you are. You've been on many shows before. Uh, Dame Baptiste, who himself had a commissioned uh, comedy series, Sunny D, on the BBC himself. How are you, sir? I'm good. You good? Oh, yeah, good, thank you. Cheers for you? coming back on. I'm well, thank you. Um, so let's get to it. Noughts and Crosses. Um, I know that some of you haven't read the book. You haven't read the book, then, have you? But you've seen this, the series that, that's the start yeah. already. Um, let me start with you, Natalie, actually, though. Um, you've read the book. You know the book. Mm -hmm. What was the impact the book had on you and your childhood when you first read the book? Um... I read it when I was about 13 mm -hmm. and I just thought it was just interesting because someone had given it to me and said, you need to read this book. Mm -hmm. So I went to um, the library, picked it up and I just thought, wow, to say that it had a major impact on my childhood, I think would be a slight stretch, but it was just interesting for the first time in my life to ever contemplate what it would be like if the position was changed. Because mm -hmm. I think at that age, 13, 14, you're very aware of your race, you're very aware of racism and you begin to see how it impacts you, especially in education. Mm -hmm. And so to read that book, to especially see Callum, who is white, but is also kind of in the, the race that is being oppressed, go through school and ask questions about the way history is being taught, the way he's being treated. It was something that I could very much relate to. Mm. And so in that sense, I think it kind of opened my eyes to see that the things that I was thinking about in my head weren't just my imagination or a hypersensitivity, but were a reality. And I think because of that, that is why the book has had such a great impact with children, because it's the first opportunity for them to actually see their experiences in a book, but written in a very different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I think when you're younger and you begin to think this is racist or this is not fair, I'm being discriminated against, you are at first hit with the thing of hypersensitivity, it's all in your head, no, it's not, it's not the case. Whereas you can see a book which you know, lets your experiences play out and kind of gives you that justification to think, no, this is not all in my head. There is racial discrimination in education because I think that's the first place it really hits us as young people. Um, Simeon, on, on that, what did you make of the book when you first read it? And when you did read it for the first time, at what point did you understand what Blackman was doing? The thing is that I read Mallory Blackman's book so long ago, I didn't really remember the premise, to be honest with you. I think it's one of the books that I, I forgot about. I did see the adaptation mm. of the book. It's an interesting because I think that there are books that you read at different kind of stages of your life and depending on when you consume it, it has a very different kind of impact. Mm. People say that if you read Malcolm X autobiography as a kind of teenager, it can have a massive kind of impact on your perspective mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So I think re-watching it as an adult, especially when you're far more familiar with the story of apartheid in South Africa, when you've consumed so much images over the past kind of five years online of kind of you know, violence and inequality and from Black Lives Matter. I think for me, it was obviously less powerful. Mm. I think that as a piece of work, I think what will really be kind of the acid test is what impact it has on kind of mainstream or white audiences at home, you know, in parts of the country that don't really have these kind of conversations, seeing kind of an inverse of that narrative. Mm. And I think maybe that is where the power of certainly the visual representation of it goes. And there's quite a lot of good details in the directing of the of the series that, that I think would be quite provocative. Uh, and Dane, what did you make of the episodes you've seen so far and the general premise of what Blackman is doing with the reversal of, uh, you know, a difference in worlds for different races? I feel like I understand probably around it why, why that has, as a, uh, a vehicle has come up about now, because I guess the conversation regarding race relations has become a lot more heated socially, maybe over the last couple of months or so mm. in this country and following the election. Personally, I kind of, I, 
I was very aware of the books when I was younger, but I was never really interested in like reading that much young adult. And I also feel like when it comes to issues like race relations, the truth is a lot stranger and a lot more harrowing than the fiction. So I was somebody like, rather than reading something like that, I kind of was aware of something like The Black Jacobins by like CLR James, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot more graphic in describing like uh, the instances of like violence and racial iniquity from like chattel slavery up until like segregation era. But um, the show's okay, but I'd say aesthetically, and it might be me just being maybe a bit of a pedant about it, but I was like, if an African empire has taken over Europe, why are they speaking English in their own homes? Mm. That, was, that was just me, and and I, and, I'm, and, I, and it's my it's a personal thing for me. Whereby, like any when I see a kind of uh, dystopia being depicted, where the uh, roles are reversed in terms of race relations, I really feel like unless you're going to show it to the, ex the same graphic level mm -hmm. as you know institutional or structural racism has been applied to uh, Africans, then it's not really going to have the same impact. Yeah, so yeah. just following from Simeon's point, when it's like uh, he'd be interested to find out how like white audiences take it. I feel like you probably take it in the same way because most of the time when you depict these things of like forbidden love, it normally does involve like a white man mm. as a love mm. interest, which True. seems to be a lot more palatable. Like if you think about films like, uh, uh, I think it was Loving with yeah, uh, yeah. Ruth Negger as well. Um, yeah, it seems to be a lot more palatable to show like that kind of paradigm where you do have a white man falling in love with a black woman. So Nasi, do you, do you feel that it was maybe a, a tamed, a t toned down version of what's really going on? They've flipped it, but they haven't really gone into what it's really like being the oppressed. I think taking a step back, there's always kind of that acknowledgement that this is a YA book. Yeah. And it is for young people. Mm -hmm. And so there will always be a slight taming of it because reading it as a teenager mm -hmm. and reading it as an adult, like Simon says, you have a different impact. But I think if that was a book written for adults, it probably would be a lot more graphic. But it is written for young adults, for people from who ages of 12 to 16 mainly. Mm -hmm. And that will naturally manifest itself in any adaptation. So it's there are valid points in terms of saying it's not exactly like it would be if it was genuinely 110% flipped. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that the book was written and was slightly tamed and maybe it wasn't necessarily picked up in the adaptation but one reading made very kind of i would say discrete points that people could resonate with but it's not going to be as gra graphic or as detailed as we would like or reflect reality all the way because of the audience that the book is for mm -hmm. so simeon i mean do you feel like we've kind of touched on it a little bit then but do you feel like a lot of uh, the unrest and dis disquiet comes from subjugated minorities do any of you feel, I'll start with you, Simon, any sympathy with any of the, the characters of the, the noughts in, in this? Because, you know, we're that person. So watching it from a purely TV point of view, at any point, did you think, uh... I mean, it's, it's hard for me to engage with it on that kind of a level when I know so much about the brutalities of apartheid, mm -hmm. right? So really, when I'm watching it, I'm rethinking of that struggle, reading those books. And obviously, apartheid was a part of it was a localized version of what was happening internationally, you know, with, you know, segregation in the U.S., yeah. kind of the uh, just oppression of people of African heritage across kind of the Black Atlantic. So for me, it's like even though they've in, they've inverted the story, I'm like, well, I know the real story yeah, yeah. in far more detail. Mm -hmm. And so although you can have a, a story which, to some extent, maybe is not necessarily written to my sens sensibility. I feel like, it, it, if anything, what it, what it did do was it made me think more about just how kind of systemic the impression of people of African heritage has been. It wasn't a case of me sympathizing with the white character because I know he's an actor. Yeah. And so I feel like it's really hard to take a very graphic history and then say, okay, how would you feel if it was reversed? For me, that is not a radical idea, a radical premise at this moment in time. Maybe if you're younger then, and you're just kind of being educated into this narrative, then yes. But for me now, it was like, no. Uh, Dane, some, some of the scenes in the, in the BBC series, I've seen three and a half of the episodes so far. Um, there's a couple of scenes that I remember kind of chuckling and laughing at, and I kind of had to very quickly catch myself because I remember thinking, you're laughing at this particular scene, but that's you. If that, you know what I mean? That's you. And did anybody else kind of find themselves getting lost in the, the, the actual show and not the premise? Did, did you ever, ever lose yourself in thinking, hang on a minute, this is, this is a story of what's actually happened to me and my people in the way that I did sometimes? Uh, 
Maybe it's just me. No, no, <laughs> I, I, was, I was the same as you. Like, as I said, and, I'm, and we're all aware that the aesthetic of the adaptation is to kind of, you know, be geared towards a, maybe a younger audience. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, as Simeon said, when you're aware of the nuances of uh, oppression and structural and institutional racism, how they exist in reality, it's very hard for you to identify when you see quite a uh, superficial version of it. Because one of the big uh, controversies with the adaptation is that it's missing uh, a key character, which is uh, Lynette. Yeah. She's yes. a Callum's sister. And when you think about her role in the actual novels, she provides a large part of the context for where we arrive at the story. Because obviously there's historical like kind of abuse that she deals with from an interracial relationship, which kind of would allow you to identify a lot more with the paradigm you see in the show. But because you don't really have that, as Simon said, it's like, and as you said, you see parts where you're like, it comes across as being a bit more kitsch than being a lot more graphic. And it's like, to be honest, it's kind of like, it's kind of cute, really. Especially because, I mean, having this kind of dystopia or utopia where you look at where these roles are reversed. Like, I'd seen it before where Quentin Tarantino had the film uh, White Man's Burden. And they had, like, John Travolta and Harry Belafonte. And it's kind of the same premise of it, the roles being reversed, but in America as well. So, again, it's like when you've seen the uh, same, I guess, uh, yeah, okay, you kind of see this, the same kind of premise yeah. that's been represented before and done in a, in a lot more of a graphic way. Yeah, I did find it hard at some points where I was kind of laughing. And as I said before, where I was like, in the beginning, where I was like, but people, everyone's speaking English in their own homes, which yeah, again, yeah. I think in order for you to show like that nuance of having the roles reversed, you'd have to, it's, it's, you know, for those of us who are the oppressed, it is small things like, you know, having a lack of awareness of your language and your history and uh, certain traditions, which seem to be able to be expressed in, you know, in the world that was created in the adaptation. So, yeah, I laughed at a few things. And also, and also, when you think about it, when you do come from an oppressed minority, being able to laugh at certain situations when you see them represented in, uh, like, art is a big part of the whole way you rationalise how you deal with racism in the first place, you know. Yeah. And who are the characters, I'll ask all three of you, who are the characters in particular, I'll start with Natalie, that, that stuck out to you? Who were the people that you really resonated with? Any of the family? I think, I, to be fair with you, I don't think I particularly related to any of the characters. I think the point you make about Lynette not being present is interesting because she, and the fact that she was in an interracial relationship and what happened to her and her state of mental health because of that. And I, I did notice that, that she has gone and I did wonder why that had happened because yeah. that, again, like you said, was quite important. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that I resonated with any of those characters. I definitely didn't resonate with Sefi and her sister. I definitely didn't resonate with Callum and his brother Jude. I think that it's very difficult to say you resonate with these characters because they are white. Mm -hmm. And so even if you have done an inversion and flipped it, as far as I can see, that's still a white character. So there may be some type of sympathy to a point, but to say I resonate, I think is not at all. N not at all. I mean, it could be could be very subconscious as well, whereby like we we're so used to seeing exactly, white heterosexual so. male protagonists that you're kind of like it seems bad, but how bad could it be really? <laughs> because you know we've always always seen yeah. that paradigm where you see like yeah, a, yeah. A, a white male as an underdog mm. who you know so and and fighting against something oppressive. So you know for a lot of audiences, it's probably a lot easier for them to identify with that kind of character because it's a very uh, you know it's a very commonly seen aesthetic. So. Mm. Well, Manu Blackman has also spoken about how, she, when she was writing Callum, she put a lot of her own experiences in that particular character. She definitely did. Um, what, what does that say to you? What does it say to me? Yeah, about the fact that she kind of thought it was important to put some of her experiences as the minority or the oppressed in one of the key characters itself. No, I, I mean, I get what she's trying to do. I mean, clearly she's trying to give the characters authenticity. She's trying to show you as, as much as possible to create a three-dimensional view of what it means to be an oppressed minority. I mean, this is what good writers do. And, you know, she's a very good writer, Mallory Blackman. I mean, how that translates, I mean, it's really hard as adults to talk about something which is very much diluted and at the heart of it with a kind of a premises which looks radical, but actually in the way it's being presented to us over the past 20 years is not. As you mentioned, you know, again, you have a white kind of protagonist in it you know again you have this idea you know interracial relationships being kind of taboo but somehow revolutionary which for me is it's, it's a very problematic premise which I don't even think it's true anyway mm -hmm. so I don't know it's um I think you, you, you see layering from Mallory Blackman she, she, she's, she's a good writer but I mean in terms of how it punches and slaps today for me several years on from when she's written it in a kind of post Black Lives Matter world uh, I'm, I'm struggling. I am struggling to be 
and move myself. I, I, I just add on from that point as well. I think also, and you can definitely argue that this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good reason for this, a good reason for this uh, show to be made. Yeah. It may have come along a bit later. So there was probably a point in time, maybe at a time when the book was out, that this adaptation would have made a lot more sense because I think we were a lot more open to having discussions about race relations mm -hmm. and it would have been a lot more relevant. The thing with Noughts and Crosses now is that mm -hmm. even though I guess, it's, I guess it's come out to kind of parallel uh, conversations or racial tensions that we're having at the moment, really what we're dealing with in reality is more of a resurgence in like uh, supremacist ideology and, uh, and global fascism. And so even though it does cover some of the topics, I think with what we're dealing with in terms of the incarnation of racism today is a bit different to how it's depicted in Noughts and Crosses, which might, probably would have dealt, as I said, a lot more with like issues of like segregation and kind of memory and Jim Crow. And yeah. as Simi said, at a time when, you know, miscegenation was more of an issue, yeah. whereas now, not that it's not the same issue that it is, but as a more of a globalised community, we're dealing with more issues in terms of like juxtaposing racism with capitalism and, you know, dealing with new underclasses in the form of like asylum seekers and and migrant workers. So there's a lot more, I guess, uh, intersectionality where race is concerned nowadays. I think it's very difficult to um, take a book that was written 20 years ago yeah, yeah, for young yeah, adults yeah. to yeah. adapt it. And I think we have to be careful to actually understand what who the book was written for, yes. when it was written, and who the adaptation is for. And I'm, not every project can do everything. Sure. So all of the points you've raised are very, very valid, and I agree. But then I'm not sure whether it is fair to expect noughts and crosses yeah. to deal with that unless you were to move away completely and, and completely change no. the story. Right. No, but I think it does. I think it does with it well. But I just think, as I said, my thing is it's the chronology of it is that late, yeah. it's a bit. It's a, It's happened a bit late because in the scope of 20 years, what you've essentially had because we've had no one being willing to create this kind of art, which this stimulates this kind of conversation. Now, with that 20 years, you've had a whole generation now who are now the economically mobile, who probably have kids of their own, who probably would have grown up reading stuff like Noughts and Crosses, and now that the conversation about race relations has come up again, that's why they're kind of like, well, I can't be racist, I read Noughts and Crosses, and I really enjoyed the book. And oh, so, no, yeah. I th I don't, no, I, I, dis I, dis I disagree with that completely. Right. I think, talk is saying, because you read, uh, that whole conversation about people saying they cannot be racist, that, again, is, it, I think is slightly separate. I think what Noughts and Crosses is about for me personally, is highlighting the experience of the other. So if you're reading it as a young black person, it's about saying, even question points in the book about, you know, for example, Callum has a gash in his forehead and he gets a plaster and the plaster is a black color. Mm -hmm. Now we are lucky that we have plasters of different shades, but that was still relevant a year or two years ago. It's things like that as a young person, you read it and you think, yeah, every time I've had a plaster, every time I've had a bandage, it's never been my skin color. Just things like that. Or when, for example, when Callum is in history and he's saying like, well, why aren't there any, you know, naught professors? And the teacher turns back and says, well, there we're not here any. to learn about, there aren't any. And that is completely untrue. I think that those things are still happening to an extent today. And so it is good to be in a situation or to have a piece of literature which allows young black people to have those to actually see that written and to see that experience again like I said before that validation of it I think that to, to we, we need to get to a point where we understand that it's not this, this adaptation is more about I believe starting a conversation and I know, I know you might think that's a cop-out, but it is. It's more about starting a conversation and the beginning of an imagination where it is different. The inversion is not radical, like you said, because loads of other people have done it. I've read other books um, by other black British authors where they have done similar things, like Bernadine Avaristo did it for one of her books as well, when she imagined a completely different world, whereas if white people were enslaved and they were actually living in Africa. Um, and I've read that and people criticise that for very similar reasons that we're raising here, because sometimes it is an oversimplification. I'm I, I think on the point of the conversation, I guess it's like it comes back to who is starting, who's who, where is somebody starting for that conversation, right? So I feel like some of the points around kind of uh, the character with the white character not unable to get a, a, a plaster that suits I know, their it's complexion, a small point, or, but, or even the fact yeah. that you know with the character with the white characters put their hair into Afro styles, so like a high top or the women or dreads or, dreads, or locks yeah. or whatever. So. These ideas, I think, might be useful if you're, if you're maybe a white person at home watching it and thinking about these things that you never thought about. But I think coming to it as an adult and asking what is the value then for somebody of a level of awareness, even if you're, even if you're a young black uh, teenager 
who's growing up in an age of kind of Instagram and Twitter in which kind of race is super kind of relevant and in the zeitgeist, I will I query with the amount of awareness that, that exists, how much does this slap? Maybe if you have known nothing about it, that's, then this kind of thing is somehow provocative. And that for me is the, is the test of the okay. work. But for young black teenagers who are aware, I then query, okay. Yeah, but there's a, for me, there's a sliding scale because there's an assumption that we all sitting here, three individuals, we have a very heightened level, sorry, for, have a heightened level of awareness. So like we've said before, it's not going to have the same impact it yes. would have. But we shouldn't assume that because you're in a world of social media where there's so much information out there that people, young black teenagers, actually engage with it. Some people might just use Twitter for banter. They might just use TikTok for banter. They might just use Instagram to figure out how to do their hair or what trainers to get. There shouldn't be an assumption that because information is widely available, that that information is accessed. And so you could have a first year old black teenager who watches Noughts on Crosses and it does have an impact on them because it's dealing with issues subconsciously that they haven't really assessed. There's, it's a sliding scale okay. in terms of who... Well, but hang on, on that, I think that's important because how important do you think this book is for the young people in understanding race? And should this be a book, I think it's in some schools, but should this be a book that's in all schools for them to un better understand what racism is what? and... I would wonder what the purpose of it is because because even when we discuss like the book and the synopsis and stuff like how the I guess the situation is inverted for me is that's like the supposition that like white people weren't slaves so for me that is a problem in itself because are we trying to do a alternate version of history because then then it has to I would think for it to be effective in stimulating a good conversation has to reflect history so for me it's small things like the, this idea that there were no white slaves is probably a problem. I think it's a problem unto itself. Would you put this? Would you make this book mandatory as part of the curriculum in all schools? No, I would not, because as like I said, I just think that you you would need, for me, like I said, for that, this conversation to be effective in itself. Yeah. Then there needs to be yeah. You would have to have the initial study of the history whereby you know members or white audiences and of and members of society need to be aware as, as well that feudalism in this country was equivalent to slavery or having indentured servants in the form of the Irish maybe being shipped to America was also a form of slavery so if we're gonna if the idea is to maybe try and help conversation by showing a showing some kind of like you know with, with the reverse roles to find some kind of like commonality between the two parties I don't know if that's particularly effective because then it's creating this idea or this narrative that like there's always been this white supremacy, which is not always really the case. Do you think this will be a defining book for, for young people at all? Do you think that this book for, I mean, you've all said that this is maybe a, you know, a few years too late and the current people watching this is maybe not for them. It won't bang as much as it might have banged if the series had come out 15 years ago. No, I, won't, I, no? I wouldn't say that. No? I, I think at the end of the day, I think there needs to be, there's, for me, we can't, you can't do everything mm -hmm. that needs to be done in one book. You cannot do everything that needs to be done in one series. And so I think that it gets a bit, for want of a bit of word, I think it's a bit, it's a bit annoying to take this book and want it to do a full version and to yeah. fix everything and to flip everything. And I think sometimes you just need to meet you need to meet literature where it is and what it's trying to do. It is trying to flip and say, what if we did not have White supremacy, white, white supremacy, it's not going to every single edge of the world. It's very London based. Mm -hmm. It's clearly based on Mally Brackman's experiences mm -hmm. as a young person. And she said it, the st whole Stephen, the Stephen Lawrence um, murder and the investigations after that inspired triggered her, her, yeah. her, triggered her, inspired yeah, yeah. her to write this book. I think we need to be really careful because history in and of itself is so broad mm -hmm. to say that for it to truly be effective, it needs to be a flip and inversion. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the book actually, correct me if I'm wrong, actually talks about slavery. It talks, it talks about obviously about um, the invasion and colonialism, fair enough. It doesn't necessarily go into that depth of level of slavery. What it does is it say, Africans invaded Europe, now Africans are in control. Very, very simple, very, very simple, very simplistic, but that's where it gets you to the point to try and explain why white people are oppressed. And I think if we want to then start turning around and saying that book kind of represents in a way that white people were never enslaved. That's a reach. I think the book for me is impactful and I think the series and having representation on TV and as I've said to people it is interesting to imagine what it would be like if black hair was the norm. Even if the even if the series doesn't perfectly 
demonstrate that it is interesting to see a white woman in a black hairdresser trying to have her hair cane rolled or trying to make her hair curly, especially as a young girl who's relaxing her hair since the, uh, actually straightening her hair since I was about four years old. Though Kim Kardashian doing that a lot though these days. I'm ignoring you, <laughs> but do you see, I'm, I'm ignoring you, but do you see what I'm saying? So I think that we just need to be careful because we can we can criticize something to the point where we undervalue it, and it's for me this is a valid this is a valid contribution. See, especially see, but it's not British. the answer. The thing is, yeah. but no one book is going to be the answer. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, the thing, the thing, I would say I somewhere in between where I think that the work has value. I think that it's in schools and it should be in schools, and I think that it does have impact. It does have impact. My question is, how much impact and impact for who? And I mean, it's, it's hard to answer this as like a man in his thirties than as a fifteen-year-old kid. But I, I feel that. The book in itself, in this day and age, I can see having more impact with maybe white teenagers who just don't consider this than maybe black teenagers who, even though there is a kind of broad spectrum of kind of consciousness, I think that young people are becoming far more radicalised about ideas of race and gender than certainly I was at that age. I mean, yeah, it's, it's all consuming. I think the zeitgeist is very much gearing towards identity politics, which is very strong right now. And so I think that actually, I think that this is the case of a book which really is only provocative for people with zero consciousness, which is white people. So it's a case of like, when we write books for black history being for white audiences, which for me has value. I feel like black history should be taught in Eton, it should be taught in Stowe, it should be taught in all white areas because they need to know the other side of the story that they're not, they're not telling. So for me, I just query that when we're talking about kind of this book, that we're talking about it beyond the context of the impact it's having for black people, because I feel like actually Agreed. right now the impact is not for us. I hear you. Um, Dane, do you think this though opens up a more an opportunity for a more nuanced conversation about race? So is this an easier yeah. way to, for people that don't quite get it to understand what black people are always talking about? Yeah, and I think as Natalie says, is that sometimes there are, there are you know, it's about a personal experience and, that, and those are, uh, you know, Mallory's anecdotes. And sometimes for people that are completely oblivious, then you know, having this kind of nuanced perspective can be effective, but I just think I'm just concerned with whereby, you know, how it's appeared like on the BB stuff, I don't want it to be, this vehicle to be kind of elevated as like the definitive, yes. um, I hear uh, it. yeah, the definitive format for discussing race relations. Yeah, so, that, yeah. so, but um, yeah, because everyone's experience is different and it's too broad a conversation when you're dealing with a phenomenon that's woven into social fabric. So I think that's going to be solved or stimulate the entire conversation mm -hmm. and everyone's individual experience in the space of like a mini series. Is it fair so, to compare Mary Blackman to Jacqueline Wilson in terms of her impact on our community? Or? I mean, I mean, Ma Mary Blackman is, she matters to us, you know, she's a very important writer, you know, so she's a special woman, like she's, she's in the history books, like we, like we, we, we need her. I think in this case, for me, I mean, I'm not smart enough, but I can't make the comparison between them. I don't know, I feel like Jacqueline Wilson writing a slightly different type of book. Even but in terms she, of the impact that she had for the young people that she was writing to? I, I, th I think that a lot of people have been... Have, I, I, I remember, I read, I know that I read, I read Mallory Blackman's books and what struck me about them, what drew me to them was actually the cover. Seeing black people on books in the 90s was something that was, was new to me, especially books that were more kind of comprehensive and like a bit more YA, YA. So for me, that had a lot of value. So even when there was a period where obviously I'm not engaging with Mally Blackman books as much because I'm, I'm older. The name still have, means it has a lot of currency to me. Like, oh yeah, Mally Blackman. I used to read some of her books. Some of it I didn't always understand at the time. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yes, yes, I, I, I remember that. I remember being gross and asking questions. So for me, that, that has a lot of value. Yeah. Um, and just a couple, last couple from me. Uh, Stormzy and Tiny Temper have referenced Mally Blackman in, in a lot of their, a lot of their, their music and, and their tracks. How important has youth culture been in bringing her name to those that maybe didn't know who she was and, and the great work that she's done? Those are two massive, they're, they're pop stars now, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, I think, I think it has been important because I think where people haven't read the, where people haven't read the book, it's kind of raised that awareness because not everyone automatically read Noughts and Crosses. It got passed to me by a friend, it wasn't given to me mm -hmm. by my parents and it wasn't on my curriculum. And so not that I necessarily as an adult would go go back and read it if I heard Stormzy or Tiny Temper mention it. But I think to, for Stormzy to come out and say that that was the most important book to him in his childhood, that will influence a lot of people to go and actually 
to go and actually read is, it yeah. and find out who she is. And like Simon says, she is very, very important to us. She's a very, very good reader. And I think her body of work in the Noughts and Cross story, Noughts and Crosses stories, are phenomenal. And more importantly, other stories that she's written outside of that, for example, such as the Pig Heart Boy, um, where she, the focus of her of the book was a black boy and a black family are very, very important, especially in the 90s when we didn't really have that. So I think, again, it's not even if you don't necessarily agree with the full premise, I think the idea that you have a black family which is very financially stable, you have a parent, you have a parent who is a, a government official and you have a very wealthy, established black family, sometimes that as a very basic level can have an influence on readers. And just to go back to this Jacqu Jacqueline Winston thing, I think it's a completely invalid comparison. I think Jacqueline Wilson, I didn't actually read her books as a, as a child, but I had a lot of friends who did. I think it's not fair in terms of the type of books that they read yeah. to draw such a comparison. Yeah, yeah. I think Mary Button is a completely different type of writer with a completely different... It was more the impact that, that she had yeah, on but even that audience, the Mary Button's impact on this audience. No, I, I, still... I, just don't, I just don't see where on earth they would kind of come like no, no I just yeah I, I don't I'm I'm very conscious not to draw those type of blanket comparisons because I think that they do more damage than good okay. and I think that black Mary Button doesn't need to be compared to a white writer yeah, yeah. white audiences especially the type of writing that she does okay um, final question to all three of you briefly what next where do we go now in terms of the discourse of racism in, in Britain in 2020 and, and what can this series and, and indeed the book trigger for the rest of this year and going forward in 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 having and better help people understand racism in 2020. I mean, Start I, you, Dave. me personally, I feel like uh, the, where I've been frustrated in seeing uh, discourse about race is that it comes from the perspective of people making an inquiry, almost as if they're trying to seek validation or have maybe their white counterparts corroborate their accounts of racism. Mm. And for me, I'm like, this is yeah. not an inquiry like the McPherson. It's a foregone conclusion. Like, yeah, yeah we're not, exactly. Because it's not as if we'd have been like, do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't care. It's yeah. whether you know what we mean or not, this exists. So I, I just think, yeah, which is why I'm saying, like, I, I, de I definitely, yeah, think Manny Blackman's definitely should be celebrated as, as an author. But, and, it's, and it's, I don't think it's her remit for her to kind of be stimulating this kind of conversation. So I think where we go from here is initially, yeah, this agreement whereby we shouldn't be trying to seek, uh, yeah, as I said, um, uh, confirmation from uh, our white counterparts about the existence of racism. Natalie? I don't think I could have um, said it better than Dane. I think a lot of clear in this conversation is be the series. A lot of pressure has been put on the series when I yeah. think all it does is going to spark one of the many conversations. So many things happen in the media on a day to day basis. Um, so many things have happened. Harry and Meghan has stimulated a conversation. Boris Johnson's election has stimulated a conversation. There are so many things happening regularly that stimulate conversations. I think it's just one of those things. And I don't think the series, again, should be pegged as mm -hmm. an incident that is going to lead to like a new conversation. Yeah, the conversation they're trying to make it like the young roots and it's not that yeah. basically. Yeah, I think it's just, we just, it's a book that was written that was brilliant and it is a series that, that, that some is good, like that some, some will like, some will not. I think to hold it to this really high standard because of the subject matter, especially considering it's a, a YA book and it's an ad adaptation, is just a bit too much for me. What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, can you repeat the question? just want to know whether you think this book could, should, will trigger uh, a, a different discussion and discourse uh, in trying yeah. to help people understand I, what racism is. I, I think... Um, there are some people that, as Dane alluded to, don't I, quite understand I, what racism is. I think maybe white audiences may be able to have a different vantage point from when people talk about things like microaggressions and things of that nature. Mm. But I think that that's a lot of pressure to put on this series, which actually takes, inverts the story of kind of like apartheid, you know what I'm saying? I feel like actually the real unpacking of the legacy of kind of racism in this country mm. is complex. Where black British kind of communities are at this moment in time is complex. And I don't actually think we have I think that there are lots of different pieces of work which collectively are part of a new kind of discourse that we're having right now. But I think that actually in mainstream spaces, I don't, I don't really think that that has really been fully unpacked. And I think it's, I think it's hard to make this book, a book that was written 20 years ago about 
apartheid in South Africa, drawing on obviously localized Mary struggles Blackness here. Mary has never said it was about apartheid. Though. I mean, it's very overt. It's like, no, no, she's I mean, never actually said that. She I said mean, it was about her experiences. I mean, she doesn't need to say it. I mean, it's so overt. I think I can make that statement. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I mean, don't think so. I think that's a reach. Uh, uh, only because, I, only because I, there was a... It's not a reach at all. I mean, it depends where you're from. How can you say it's not a reach? Because, because, I mean, I'm, so, I'm only going from where I saw the, uh, so where it's the conspicuous signs where it's like, no, hand, a white hand can't hold a black yeah. hand. That, that they even thought it's South Africa, for heaven's sake. They even cast South African actors. Yeah, that speaks more about overt racism that you would have seen in apartheid and more institutional as opposed to what you see. Yeah. in the UK which is not more than over. What do you mean? Are you <laughs> very clearly taking the part of the story? That is not a reach. reach. Even, a, even, a, not even a, a big truncheons and stuff like that. That's yeah. not even a slight reach. Like the aesthetic is I very got, clear. I, yeah. I, I got a rap, but Simi, Natalie and Dane, cheers for coming on the show this week. Don't forget, subscribe to us if you haven't already here on Blackademic TV and across all the socials, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And go check out our website as well, blackademic.com. Till next week, peace. Oh,